You are listening to the Cycling Podcast at the Giro d'Italia in association with Rafa. The fastest clothing in the world tour, the home of cycling with character. Ride and watch with Rafa in 2019 as they partner with EF Education First and Canyons Ram. Today we are in San Martino di Castrozza. <laughs> Where are we, Daniel? So, Rich, we're on the Passo di Rolle. And um, it is the bounden duty of every seeker after the picturesque to visit the Rolle Pass at some time or other. The journey will leave upon his mind an enduring imprint of transcendent loveliness. Wow. Um, that, that wasn't ch- actually... That was, Freeman. <laughs> that was Charles Freeston. Third person um, as well, was it? Charles Freeston, who wrote one of the seminal guidebooks um, about well, cycling in the Alps. I think probably the first ever uh, guidebook about cycling in the Alps. But I think that was from his High Roads of the Alps, written in uh, 1910 or 1911. Fantastic job to commit that to memory, though. Incredible, uh, in the way really. That you've done. Uh, we're in the Dolomites. We're we are. Dolomites. We can say that we're officially in the Dolomites. Ale mountains, um, as they're often known in Italy. Well, they are beautiful. We're surrounded by these towering peaks. Uh, the sun is just dropping behind one of them now. And when it does, when the, cl- the sun is covered by clouds or mountain, it gets really, really cold. Um, and it's quite windy here. Hopefully you can't hear the wind too much. We're just in the Astana Team Hotel here. Well, we're just outside, aren't we? Yeah. Just behind you, Rich, is the is Estana bus. Chimon de la Pala oh, yeah, uh, that. mountain, and that is known as the, the Matterhorn of the Dolomites. Well, I can see why, Daniel. Um, so we are, yeah, finally in the Dolomites, first of two big mountain stations. We were open tonight with some some atmosphere from the start, that, from the finish, rather. That was the, the noise as Esteban Chavez took a very emotional win here. Um, and, well, that's been a long time coming hasn't it uh he was in that big break and really the favorite to win from that break and they were given enough rope to 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 contest the stage which wasn't what their ds matt white predicted this morning was it no but he did predict well he did tell us that esteban chavez was going to get in the break didn't he He said that there were three mitchelton scott riders earmarked to get in the break and they were chavez hamilton and we didn't actually nieve oh nieve we thought that the the last one was probably Nieve. Unless it might have been Simon Yates, who knows, has some master plan to propel him up the overall classification. Well, stage 19, 151 kilometres from Treviso to San Martino di Castrozza. Castrozza? Uh, thank you. A um, uh, big break when, I mean, it was, a, it was a late start. Treviso was absolutely beautiful. It was a really s- picturesque start to this stage. Started just outside the old Pinarello. Bottega or shop which is now closed down but Pinarello had a shop that's where um, Pinarello come from yes correct that's where um, they originate they, from the shop used to be run by Nani Pinarello a former black jersey in the I think a former black jersey um, certainly he used to compete for the black jersey or the which was know, the, the, the last man. the Lantern Rouge um, in the 50s so a break formed pretty early in the stage um, it included well Esteban Chavez was there obviously uh, Peter Seri was there from De Kooning Quick Step uh, Manuel Seni was there from Bardiani uh, Francois Bidar from age 2 r they've been active the last few days uh, Marco Mar- Marcato UA Team Emirates uh, Manuel Boaro from Astana who's he's just in the, not the bar happy, about is he? 10 metres from where we're sitting and uh, yeah he had a he had a he had a good goal before the final climb but didn't quite work for him uh, three riders tried to bridge across uh, they were Giovanni Carbone Nate Brown and Guillaume Boivin from Israel Cycling Academy and uh, Carboni actually made it across uh, incredibly uh, got up to the group and then uh, understandably I think sat on the back for a bit and started being given a hard time by our friend in the bar there Boaro uh, which wasn't really fair I think he was I think he deserved a bit of recovery time he was at fourth on the stage in the end so very good ride by him um, uh, that 
group got nine and a half minutes, so the bunch really let them uh, contest the stage, and not a lot was happening behind until the the final climb. And the climb up to here, uh, thirteen point six kilometres long, an average of five point six percent. It's a it's a bit of a motorway, isn't it? It's not steep at all. And as we drove up it, I thought if Primoz Roglic has got anything left, this is the sort of climb where he might be able to uh, show what he's got. And he gave it a go, didn't he? To give it a go, a go yeah. Anyway, Chavez kept attacking that group as it was whittled down. And, uh, it, you know, it, it, quite hard for a, a climber like him to get a gap on a on a climb like that because it's shallow enough that riders who aren't such strong climbers could, could stay with him. And it took a lot of work to really get rid of everybody. I think Chavez has shown this week, though, that he is a class act. He's a, he's got a big engine. Um, a lot of riders, we're seeing them every day, Rich, come over the line. They're on their knees, aren't they? Um, Chavez has been in two breaks now. And, um, you know, we, we talked about him earlier in the Giro. We said that he's coming to this, this race, probably not quite a race weight um, and consequently not really able to stay with the best guys in the high mountains. But the engine's obviously still there. It was interesting to hear, well, I think we'll talk about this, this a bit more a bit later but interesting to hear him talk about his recovery from all the problems that that started really at the Giro last year didn't they he was flying high won the stage to Etna and looked as though he was going to contend for the uh, overall at the Giro last year and then had uh, one terrible day and it and that was, was it and that yeah. was it he was diagnosed with the Epstein-Barr virus and his season was really wiped out barely uh, heard from him since but uh, yeah so he won the stage Andrea Vendrami was second from Androni now he actually shipped his chain uh, in the final couple kilometres and some speculating about whether he might have actually caught Chavez and won the stage had that not happened but he had terrible mechanical problems so he did very well to finish uh, second uh, Amaro Antunes Antunes the Portuguese rider at CCC happy with that Antunes. Antunes, Antunes. they've had a quiet yes. race, CCC, but um, he was third on on the day, and Carboni was fourth behind uh, Miguel Angel Lopez, Superman. Spiderman, attacked uh, the the group. Uh, you know, still in the top ten, five minutes or so down, so not not too much of a threat. But he clawed back a bit of time, forty four seconds on the other GC guys to finish thirteenth on the stage. There were no changes in the top ten, and yeah, we saw Roglic have a go, but it was all fairly easily contained and we're hoping we might get Superman on the podcast um, yeah special given guest yeah he might appear on one of these balconies right, at any moment big, Rich probably want to come down I mean he's a, big, he's a big listener isn't he he's probably there listening to last night or maybe he's listening to today's kilometre zero who knows I know he likes to catch up um, and not fall too far behind on the old cycling podcast so going into the final stage in the mountains uh, Richard Carapaz uh, of Movistar leads with a 1 minute 54 advantage over Vincenzo Nibali and a 2 minute 16 advantage over Primoz Roglic. Mika Landa is fourth at 3 minutes 3 seconds. And, you know, if the fireworks don't come from one of those four tomorrow, they never will. The fastest clothing in the world tour, the home of cycling with character. Ride and watch with Rafa in 2019 as they partner with EF Education First and Canyons Ram. What do you think about what's happened to Cycling Kit, Paul, since we first met, when it was all a bit horrendous and yeah. there I weren't mean, many things like this, were there? No, um, I mean, I think it's, it's certainly, it's certainly uh, I suppose, pioneered, really, by you when you did the uh, Sky Kit, which was when you were simplifying it. Um, so much and I think that was a, a forerunner to uh, many other uh, brands and teams now doing a lot uh, more simple uh, which is well you know congratulations to you guys because that, that was a real important step I think um, there was, there's been some pretty horrendous ones over the year do you remember the old Z uh, yeah yeah and some of them are as you say like they're really like paint paint splattered and all that that's why this is going to work really well because it's absolutely no nonsense one of the main problems is if you put stripes on the uh, on the shoulders because uh, it makes you sort of look like a triangle instead of a you know having shoulders and uh, same with shorts often if they've got lines that that uh, go in all the wrong places they don't look so great but i think we've improved massively with them with them and of course they're really practical to wear
Thank you very much indeed to our headline sponsor, Rafa. And that was the latest installment in the conversation between Sir Paul Smith, the designer, and Simon Mottram of Rafa, the man behind Rafa. Paul Smith having a bit of a go there at the Z, the old Z Peugeot uh, jersey. Some people really like that. Um, back in the from the late 80s, quite a garish design, and certainly his designs are very different. If you want to have a look at the designs he's come up with for the new Rafa Cycling Club uh, clothing range, very nice. As he says, beauty and simplicity, and it's very simple and very elegant indeed. Uh, so have a look at that at rafa.cc. No, adesso da quando Marzio ha smesso. We did it for a few years, but unfortunately now it's been discontinued. It used to be a fun tradition every year. One year we did it with rickshaws, one year we did it dragging bundles of wood behind the bikes. It lasted four or five years, I think. Marzio would dress up as a donkey and I'd be in a dolphin outfit, and we'd each have our own team of domestiques, not so much trying to help one of us win, but more to make the other one lose. At the end of it, of course, everyone would go down the hill for a big old dinner with plenty of Prosecco. The last edition in 2012 was probably the most memorable as it also doubled as Martio's retirement party. I think we did a race down the village with tiny kids' bikes, then we had to climb the San Boldo with rickshaws and we descended with three-wheel drift bikes. It was pretty dangerous, to be honest. (laughs) What on earth was that, Daniel? Well, Rich, that was Franco Pellizzotti, uh, recently the retired. Pelican. The Pelican. No, well, the <laughs> Il Delfino di Bibione, hence why he was talking about dressing up as a dolphin. Um, Franco Pellizzotti was on, was in sort of his home region or near his home region today. Um, he was talking there about a race that he and a former teammate of Pellizzotti's, Marzio Bruzzeghin, used to do every year on the Passo San Bolo, which was the first climb on today's stage route. Um, yeah, a kind of pantomime bike race, a sort of wacky race that they used to do you every were te- year. You were telling uh, me about this. Yeah, dressing up as donkeys. Um, cycling backwards. Uh, yeah, cycling How backwards. Do you do that? Oh, How do I don't you know, do I don't know. <laughs> um, getting on the old Prosecco by the sounds of it. But it sounds like great fun, but unfortunately it's been discontinued. It's sad, sad. It sounds like something Lionel might enjoy. Um, it's right up his street with a bit of extracurricular stuff going on. But um, of course, Pelizzotti is working for Bahrain Merida here. So, you know, enough of that horse play. You know, he's got a Giro d'Italia to win. A serious job to do. Yeah, well, um, they have got a Giro d'Italia to, to try and ignite and light up I mean, tomorrow. In the meantime, Rich, I don't know if you've noticed, but the mountains are aglow with an incandescent lave of living gold high in the azure firmament above the t- twilight shadow world of trees and meadows and streams. Oh that yeah, was, totally. That was um, Charles you, Merrick writing about the Passo di Rolle. You took the words out of my in mouth. The, in his great motor highways of the Alps of 1950. There's a lovely looking piece up there as well. Uh, this is a skiing uh, resort up here, isn't it? it and is. it looks it looks absolutely very inviting. And there's still quite a lot of snow, isn't there? Have you ever seen this much snow no, this late on? No, we have seen a lot of snow this week, haven't we? Um, from well, we are here. Um, remind me, how high are we today, Rich? We're Not that high, I don't think. I think we're about um, 1,400 metres. 1,400 metres, I believe. And um, we're not quite, we're a bit below the snow line, aren't we? But certainly, I think above about 1,600 metres, there's plenty. There's a real chill in there, though. Uh, but today was all about Esteban Chavez, wasn't it? That was the real, the headline of the day. And at the finish, I spoke to a couple of his teammates, uh, Lucas Hamilton, who's been riding extremely well at this Giro, what was Matt White telling us about him at the start, Dave? Did he finish second to Sivakov at the Baby Giro? Is that correct? Correct. Yeah, so um, interesting that those two have emerged in this Giro as as real prospects. He's been riding really well, rode well again today. Um, we'll hear first from Lucas Hamilton and then from Chris Yule Jensen. Oh, a good day for the team. You must be very pleased for Esteban. Yeah, super pleased for a guy like Esteban. It's a... Uh yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing actually. The guy's been through a fair bit, so it's good to see him uh, getting to back to where we know Esteban Chavez can perform. Has that been his feeling and, and your feeling as a team that he's been recovering? I think it's a year since his last his last win. Yeah, I think uh, well, the, a stage win here last year was his probably last win. Yeah, for sure. I think he's been smart about it ever since he got sick and he's been uh, building progressively, so it's uh, it's paying off. And what about you and your performance today? You, you happy with how things went and how things have gone overall in the Giro? Uh, yeah, I think I'm happy with where I'm at. I'm happy 
Um, I think the team's super happy <coughs> with, yeah, obviously, Simon's um, in a great position on GC, so, yeah, there's no complaints from our end. What, what do you expect tomorrow? A super hard day. <laughs> That's pretty much it. <laughs> Good day for the team. Were you updated out there about what was happening up front? Um, yeah, I, I have to admit, I, I did take my earpiece out going off the last climb. What is it? But uh, I, I was riding in a group with Luke Durbridge. And uh, yeah, it was, it, was a, it was a big relief to hear that Travis won, well deserved. And uh, I think uh, it's no secret that the team's ridden incredibly well throughout the last three weeks. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a real nice relief coming at the end of such a hard stage race to have a stage win, especially for a nice guy like Chavez. What, what will this mean to him? Oh, I think you'll have to ask him that, but uh, it's no secret that he's, he's gone through a good bit the last couple of years and uh, this year especially he's almost been out since this race last year so uh, for him to fight back is uh, yes it's credit to his uh, his 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 strength eh? and uh, I think for the rest of us I think it'll just mean that uh, tomorrow won't be so, so hard after all eh? <laughs> um, yeah I mean tomorrow what are you expecting tomorrow Simon I know still has overall ambitions here what 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 do you expect from the race tomorrow yeah I think uh, we're just going to approach the stage like um, with the plan that um, that we'll always have, um, and just um, try and get the most out of it. I think we've shown that um, whenever we've had had a guy on a break, we've either we've had one or, or sometimes even two, and uh, we've come away with a good few uh, top threes and stages. And uh, to have a win, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's 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 great, and it shows the strength of this team. That even though you know it's, it hasn't been exactly how we were hoping compared to. Uh, our GC ambitions, but it doesn't, hasn't changed our approach to the race, um, and that's uh, I think that's our biggest strength. Eh? I mean, both of them mentioned uh, Chavez's problems that he's had over the last year. I mean, what? How much do we know? You asked him in the press conference about his recovery from uh, Epstein Barr virus, but he's also had other health issues as well, concerned with al- allergies and so on. I believe. Well, I think a couple of months into those problems, so a couple of months after. Giro last year, um, he was in a really bad way, and I don't think at that point the the exact nature of his problems had been identified. Um, he talks about going on bike rides where he was going to eight, nine kilometres an hour and could barely turn his legs. And um, he did fear at one point that he might have to give up. Uh, he referenced in his press press conference riders like Ben Nap, um, is it Ben Nap in Chelsea, uh, Mark Cavendish who uh, had problems last year with Epstein Barr, Michael Rogers um, and um, Chavez really said today that, um, that the sort of fear has lingered almost until today. He finished on the podium in the Giro and the Vuelta that year didn't he? Yes. Second at the Giro, third at the Vuelta and it was quite yeah and won the Tour of Lombardy as well didn't he? Uh, you know he was he was on fire and really the the collapse um, at the Giro last year on that on that stage where he went from being a contender to being uh, losing a lot of time uh, and we haven't really heard, heard a lot from him since I spoke to Matt White over the winter and he said it was a real you know it was a critical season for him in terms of future his future career whether uh, he didn't know at that point whether he would return and whether he'd be able to even carry on as a professional rider uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens uh, vis-a-vis his contract now Rich because he out of contract before this well uh, contract expires at the end of the year and I think I re- I mentioned this earlier in the year that Mitchelton weren't sure what kind of offer they were going to make um, so it was all fairly uncertain will they now make him an offer I guess they probably will um, I think Chavez is allegiance to Mitchelton squad uh, Mitchelton Scott is quite strong um, his brother Brian is also riding for the Mitchelton Scott feeder team he actually talked about and um, Brian who I think is 22 years old um, in the press conference tonight and then accounts is a pretty promising rider as well here's an interesting little factoid for you looking up the the baby Giro results from 2017 Sivakov won it by just nine seconds from Lucas Hamilton Jai Hindley was third and Scott Davis was fourth the top four from that race all riding here at the Giro as is Nicola Conchi who was seventh and uh, Mikel Honoré who was twelfth chute chute à l'arrière du peloton cycling podcast team car at the back of the pack please well, that's the voice of Seb PK reminding me to tell you that tonight's episode uh, in our Giro coverage is sponsored by The Economist. The Economist is f- about far more than just economics and finance. It covers a range of subjects from world politics and business to science, technology, arts, the environment and sport. 
It helps readers prepare for what is going on in the world around them, sifting through the noise, focusing on the essential information that tells a real story at a time when facts matter more than ever. It has been a trusted source of intelligence for over 170 years, and it's for the kind of person who never stops asking questions and wants to know why the world is the way it is. Well, Rich, I've seen you reading The Economist this week. Of course, Daniel, I read The Economist all the time. Uh, I was An article that caught my eye was, called, was headlined Full of Beans, and it's about coffee, a subject close to your heart. Specifically, uh, coffee... Uh, the, the drinking of coffee in China, where it's really on the rise. Um, but the average Chinese person drinks five cups of coffee. How often, Daniel? Um, every, uh, well, it, I drink five cups of coffee every morning. Yeah, well, the average Chinese person apparently drinks five cups of coffee a year. Uh, but it is becoming increasingly fashionable and popular uh, but it's a, it's a late developer in China, and coffee there tends to be very milk and sugar heavy, which would not meet with your approval at all. But Starbucks opened in 1999. There are now 3,800 outlets in China, I read in this story. Only the US has more. And the market is growing 10% a year. There's a, a Chinese uh, coffee chain, Luckin Coffee, also with 2,300 outlets. Uh, so it's really on the rise. And uh, I find that very interesting because you think of China as a nation of tea drinkers, but clearly coffee is challenging tea. Uh, the Economist is a smart guide to the forces changing your world. If you've never stopped asking questions, get your free copy now. For a free print copy of The Economist, just text CYCLING to 78070. That's a free print copy of The Economist if you text the word CYCLING to 78070. Allora, il discorso del tiramisu... Le beccherie è un ristorantino in centro, vicino c'era un bordello, che si, chiamava, si chiamava, quando venivano fuori questi uomini erano un po' sbattuti. Ma questo quando? Ah, ti parlo del 40, 50? Ah, oh, capito. Hai capito? Gli anni 50? Perché dopo... Didn't quite follow that, Daniel. Well, Rich, um, that was you being haunted by a ghost story, as far as you were concerned, from last year, because we all remember that you weren't terribly enamoured with the Tiramisu World Cup. Not as a substitute for lunch. The, 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 the Titanic struggle between um, two towns in Italy that both dispute the honour of having uh, invented Tiramisu. Um, this morning we were in Treviso. Last night we, we talked about our slightly eccentric hotel owner. Only my ho- hotel owner, because you got kicked out. You had to go down the road. Um, anyway, this morning, of course... Got I got a free uh, Pinarello polo shirt out Oh, that. did you? Well, uh, well, this morning, of course, I got talking to her about the, the great Tiramisu debate who invented it, Treviso Tolmezzo. Um, she sort of embellished, she, had, she added further details to the story we told last year. She said that the Tiramisu, the, the pick-me-up, so Tiramisu means pick-me-up in Italian, um, that part came from the fact that next door to Le Beccheria was the brothel. And um, the, the gentleman, the clients of um, this particular brothel, she also gave me a name, um, used to come out and um, they, would, pick me up. they would go next door drunk and, you know, woozy and who knows what. And they would need to pick me up. And that was that was the tiramisu. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, well. So yeah, let's can see. We, um, could, I'm let's wondering whether we can string this story out for a uh, third year. <laughs> <laughs> it's, get, it's just starting yeah. to get interesting. Just, yeah, tiramisu, um, very adaptable dish. Does, um, does Vincenzo Nibali need a bit of a tiramisu? <laughs> well, <laughs> but, uh, but, well we, hope, we hope not. <laughs> <laughs> does he? Well, I think, um, you in all spoke, seriousness... You spoke to him at the finish. Uh, spoke, speak to him at the finish. Should we do that? Should we listen, listen that's to Nibali? I need Nibali to the finish gather first, my thoughts And then we'll gather our revelation. thoughts and we'll talk about tomorrow. I felt good. It was a tough finish, very fast, but you couldn't really do much because it was a big gear climb. The speed was high and it helped to be in the wheels. I felt good. Did Chavez win? Really? Oh good, he's a nice kid and he really deserves that. You say his parents were here, like three years ago when I took the jersey on the penultimate day. In that case, I'm even happier. So Rich, Nibali very happy about Chavez's victory. It's a good omen because, you know, Chavez's parents were there. They were there um, at Santana di Vinadio three years ago when Nibali took the pink jersey off Chavez. Um, but he didn't really talk much about yesterday's stage. What can he do? What will he do? I mean, I personally think that, you know, <laughs> attacking on the last climb, waiting till the last climb 
isn't a bad bet. Um, I seem to be in a minority um, saying that, thinking that. Uh, most people think that's going to be too late, that he needs to try something more spectacular, something more like what he pulled off at Tantana Di Minaggio, if you remember. Um, they went, um, he attacked with, with a couple of teammates, didn't, didn't he, over the Col de la Lombard? Um, and it was a sort of classic kind of bridging move gained more time on the descent and then consolidated his, his advantage on the final climb and with Damiano Caruso his mountain domestique maybe Domenico Pozzovivo as well sent one of them down the road possibly on the Paso Mangen yeah um, he's got to go from pretty far out so almost two minutes to make up and he and Carapaz fairly fairly evenly matched in the time trials. although Nibali's time trialling very well I think at the moment so he might have a bit of time on Carapaz in Sunday's time trial but how much do we think I mean well you know seconds. Eusebio Unzue has been the Movistar team manager has been talking about four seconds a kilometre to Roglic yeah do we half that do we say two seconds a kilometre bearing in mind also there's a climb on the um, a, 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 a fairly significant climb on the time trial, the 17 kilometre tri- time trial. So even if we say two seconds a kilometre, that is 34 seconds. Yeah. Um, so he needs to gain over a minute. Um, he needs something quite spectacular. He does, well over a minute, a minute and a half. Um, and the issue is not really Nibali, it's Carapaz, isn't it? He has not, there's not been a chink in his armour. He's looked incredibly composed and comfortable and not, he has not looked like a rider on the you know on the limit at all and it would be a massive surprise if tomorrow we saw him crack or even you know lose the wheel frankly he's he's looked very much in control and rich as far as some are concerned Nibli has already made his biggest mistake of the giro and um, that was about a week ago and um max Shand- the Movistar director sportif told me what he thought Nibli's big mistake in this giro has been this morning you know, Nibali is being uh, the main guy in this in this Giro, but uh, with one mission, obviously, to dismantle the robot. How, that's how Italian TV call him, and I hate that, uh, Roglic. Uh, and I think maybe lost a little bit the track of what was happening around him, because, you know, just one-on-one, I'm just looking at one guy. I mean, out there, it's everybody, you know. Are you thinking particularly about the day to Lago Seru? Well, Lago Seru, Courmayer, <laughs> we got two minutes. You know, we had time to get back, so we knew that we had to, we had to go on a mission of, of getting time back, you know. So, and we knew that somebody was doing the hard job for us, so it kind of went hand in, in to hand. We're, we're playing conservative in a way, you know, we, we're okay. And then uh, tomorrow is going to be a hard day for sure. Well, the, that's main, main thing I was when, you know, uh, Tom Dumoulin's Unfortunately, left the tour, the Giro, and uh, and, and Nibali just went on a, on a mission. I think it was it was more put up by the media and, and and everything than himself wanting to. Because I would have I would have cracked him more gently instead of going on the hard way. One, you know, going one one on one with Roglic. So you know, we we I saw that coming after day nine, you know, and after the t- San Marino when I saw the guys were riding pretty good. Okay, Landa did didn't do an exceptional time trial. Um, Richard did a really good time trial so from there on he saw that coming and we just said listen we just going to have to take advantage of it and that's what we've been doing so far it's a really good point that that stage you know we may well look back at that season that Zacharin won when Carapaz kind of sneaked away and Nibli was preoccupied with Roglic at the time yeah I, I don't know uh, you know how how much sort of Nibali was was switched on or off to Carapaz going down the road? Um, you, you know, I think we all were partly because the, the TV um, coverage didn't really show Carapaz very much when he went off down the road. There was so much happening, that, so it almost fe- felt as though Carapaz had slipped under the radar. Although, you know, Shandri had been telling journalists and been telling me for a few days that Carapaz was just absolutely flying but at that point did anyone really consider him a, a potential winner of the Giro um, you know the, the stage he won in Frascati that just seemed like a sort of not a freak and, um, and, he, and he considered 18 seconds to him that day as well 
Yeah, and, and no one really at that point was talking about Carapaz as a potential um, winner. But I do think there is something in uh, this idea that Nibali got caught up in, and Roglic as well, I think, got caught up in what Nibali was doing. And, and it was partly fed by the, the media. You know, I, after the San Marino time trial, there were people talking about um, Roglic just sort of cantering in cruising um into verona and and it was it was nibali versus roglic um and the race was pretty much over as far as the other contenders were concerned and that was obviously very wrong yeah i mean it's a minute and 20 seconds as well on the the day to uh cherisoli real um that's that's really where the giro was we may look back on that stage as, as the day the giro was won by carapaz and Nobody even really clocked that he'd vanished up the road at that time. And if you recall, uh, we watched uh, Nibali and, and Roglic kind of shadow boxing and, and, and looking at each other and, and slow, both slowing down. And they definitely weren't committed. I mean, the gap that uh, Carapaz managed to open up there just in the final few kilometers, it was testament to how well he was going, but also how slowly uh, Nibali and, and Roglic were going. Yeah, I think Carapaz has shocked everyone. Um, don't forget that Lander was very much Mozart's leader at the start of this uh, Giro. Uh, there have been there have been question marks, and doubts over whether Lander was going to be wholly loyal to Carapaz um, right up until today. I think but at this point, um, I think you have to say that this victory hope are, are gone um, unless something extraordinary happens tomorrow. And I think he will be completely loyal to Carapaz tomorrow. The Cycling Podcast at the Giro d'Italia is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you very much indeed to Science in Sport for their support of the Cycling Podcast, which enables us to be here at the Giro and to cover the other two Grand Tours, Tour de France and the Vuelta a España. Um, you can get 25% off your Science and Sport products with the code SISCP25 at scienceandsport.com. And congratulations to Alex Croft again. He emailed us today. Well done, Alex, on winning our competition to win uh, Science and Sport um, products and Rafa gear. If you'd like to be in with a chance of winning a nutrition bundle and some Rafa kit, all you have to do is follow the Cycling Podcast on Instagram and share the latest episode in your Instagram story via Spotify. The final winners, that's one male and one female, will be selected from the hat uh, to win a Rafa Pro Team Aero Suit, which uses the same technology, race winning research as their EF Education First Pro Kit. So do that to be in with a chance of winning that fantastic prize. Um, before we move on, I've had a, an email from Stacy Snyder, who you may remember is a ceramicist who made the lovely cycling podcast Giro themed mugs, which sold out um, very quickly. She had two batches. The second batch sold out in seven minutes when they went on sale. She's raised over, the mugs have raised over $2,000 for charity, and the, the, that money will be split between Ride for Charlie and the Kelly Catlin Fund. So we will get that money to those two charities and we'll nominate another good cause or causes for the Tour de France and there'll be a Tour de France themed mug available then. But that was a great success and we're very, very happy that um, the mugs sold out, that you like the mugs. We've seen lots of pictures on social media of uh, people happily drinking milky coffee well into the afternoon in their Stacey Snyder the cycling podcast design mug. I don't, I don't mug. use mugs. This is terrible. No, you shouldn't say this because she's, she's actually kept, she's very kindly kept three mugs back for each glasses. of us. I use glasses for coffee. Oh, God. Well, what, I mean, what, what will you do? I don't want to see this on e appear on eBay or anything, no, Daniel. No, but I'm, I mean, yeah. you must occasionally entertain people who might like to drink out of a mug. Possibly. Yeah. It's possible. Um, anyway, moving on, what else do we have from today's stage? And I think we're mainly looking forward to tomorrow, aren't we? And the last uh, big uh, mountain stage. It is a big mountain stage, quite an early start tomorrow, and uh, a really savage stage, it obviously is. designed to uh, bring the Giro to, to the boil before the final time trial. Will it, it is, do so? It is, Rich. Well, I think it will, but before we move on to that, just some business to clear up from today. Another good day for Hugh Carthy of EF Education First. Um, 
I spoke to him after the finish and he was in his usual sort of deadpan, non-plus kind of form. Hugh, I guess it's gone beyond the point now where you're surprised at how well you're climbing and you're surprised to be with those guys. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I was just surprised. Uh, no, I'm just enjoying it. Kind of nothing really to prove. Not so much prove, but it feels like I've nothing to prove anymore. I'm just going to ride and do what I want. And uh, yeah, it's taking a lot. Of, feels like I'm taking a lot of weight off my shoulders and a little bit more less pressure now in the bunch and in my career. Maybe I've reached a little bit of a tipping point. Uh, who knows? It's not going to get any easier, but. Uh, I think things have changed a little bit psychologically. Is that the main change? I mean, you can't really pinpoint anything in your training or even in the role you've been given by the team. No, no, nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. Training the same way, eating and uh, racing the same way, same team. So, I don't know, different factors. The team I think the team stepped up this year, everyone as a whole. And that kind of atmosphere is... Uh, it's contagious in the team when one person wins another person wins another person wins and it lifts everyone's staff as well and yeah that's definitely I think that's probably definitely a factor so yeah so many guys find it hard to be consistent also mentally over three weeks to stay focused every day but you don't seem to be struggling with that no I had a I had a couple of days like a carnival state uh, the first mountain top finish and the first first hill the day before first climb the day before and, I just thought that was probably uh, that's going to be my kind of situation now for the rest of the race maybe to 20 or on stages or anything but uh, I came back I don't know yeah, I'm glad, glad I persevered and came back so I knew my legs were better than that and so yeah just lastly you've got a front row seat of general classification battle Carapaz can you envisage him weakening at all and him giving Nibali any opportunity tomorrow um, oh, I don't know. This Nibble is pretty experienced. And he's got a few experienced teammates with him. And, uh, yeah, it's going to be difficult for Movistar, but they're looking good at the moment. They're looking good so far. Uh, yeah. I'm not really too experienced in that situation. I don't know what to, I don't know what to look for, but no, both both teams seem seem to be in control and. Uh, yeah, I quite like Hugh Carthy's kind of anti-charm. Um, he has been nominated as for Peddler de Charme in week three of the Giro, and he's well, I think it's neck and neck between him and Esteban Chavez. A lot of debate about you know who, who qualifies for Peddler de Charme and why. And the answer to that is it, there are no hard and fast rules. It can be anything at all. And I think I think Carthy for his anti-charm kind of deserves his place on the shortlist. Well, it was also, also an interesting point that he was making there in his very undemonstrative fashion about, um, well, something which will, you can link to the, the Kilometre Zero we, we released today about, you know, teams who are lacking belief and teams for whom nothing seems to be going right. And, you know, Carthy says nothing has changed for him except that self-belief, um, which has come from, you know, a couple of good rides and... Um, you know, there have been times in this year when he's he's expected to be riding in the Gruppetto and struggling, but um, he's just sort of dug in at those moments. He has the ability to stay with some of the best guys in the mountains. But it has it's been a bit like a benign virus infecting that team this year. They have all as a team they've 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 ridden pretty well. And we hear from Jonathan Votters in this episode of Kilometer Zero that came out this morning on teams that are struggling. They had a two or three years of really struggling to win anything. And this year, they have, you know, by March, they'd won as many races as they had won the previous year. So something has changed in that team. He thinks it's, well, Walters thinks it's just a little bit more money, a little bit more security. Uh, the, the money allowing them to have an extra mechanic at races, an extra soigneur, aerodynamic testing, six riders instead of three riders. They're just little things that he thinks have... Um, you know, created this kind of momentum and, and, and sense of support and um, something has, has happened in that team and, and something has not still not happening in other teams and that's really what the episode of Club Zero looks at. Um, I also spoke at the finish, Daniel, to uh, Joss Van Emden, the uh, Jumbo Visma 
rider. Time trials won the stage into Milan a few years ago, which nobody remembers because it was the day that Tom de Moulin moved from fourth to first to win the Giro. Uh, de Moulin was second on the day and Van Emden actually won the stage. Uh, he's been an important teammate for Primoz Roglic here. And uh, here's what he had to say at the finish about Roglic and about his prospects for tomorrow. I spoke to you about a week or so ago about Primoz. Uh, he's still obviously in a, in a good position in the race. We saw him have a little attack today. What are your thoughts going into tomorrow's stage? Oh, it's hard to say. Uh, to be honest, I haven't uh, had a look in the book yet. I, I, look, I always look day by day. So, Otherwise, on this day, you think about the next day. Uh, uh, well, it's I think very hard, I can tell you that much. Yeah, that, 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 I, I know that. Uh, it's going to be hard, and uh, I think Primoz is still good. Um, he's fresh in his head too. He showed today, so uh, I think it's still there's still a uh, lot, lots of the uh, yeah, it's still possible. As far as he and you and the team are, are concerned, the race is still is still on. Nothing is decided yet, I guess. No, nothing is decided yet. No, no, and I think Nibali is also uh, feeling strong. Uh, yeah, so let's let's see tomorrow. Have you been impressed by how Primoz has? He obviously started the Giro in great form. Has he been quite consistent throughout in terms of his mood around the team and his his uh, his sort of uh, attitude towards the race? Well, in the Grand Tour, it's always ups and downs. Uh, so uh, physically and mentally, and uh, I think last weekend were, was not the best. Uh, he was not in the best shape, but still, he did a great job. Uh, so let's hope tomorrow he's uh, he feels 100 percent again. And, uh, to and, then, and then this Sunday you'll be you'll be fancying the time trial as well, are you? Mm. No, not so much. No, it's uh, my legs pretty hurting, and uh, uh, it's not a, a time trial that suits me perfect. But not a repeat of Milan then. I I wish I wish so, but uh, to be honest, I think it's it's uh, it's too hard. It's, uh, it's four to five k climbing, and it's, uh, I want to have uh, fifty. Uh, I want to go fifty uh, k's an hour average, and uh, that won't be possible there. So Van Emden there saying that he only it's one day at a time for him. He hasn't looked at tomorrow's stage uh, to really study it properly. Um, but what I mean, what can we expect? You mentioned Nibali, um, not going to leave it all to the final climb. So we expect something to happen a bit earlier in the day. Well, Rich, I think um, halfway up the Pass on Mangin, which is the second climb of the day, um, Mikael Lander is going to get off his bike and he's going to run into the woods and he's going to disappear. Um, and uh, members of the Movistar team are going to run after him and try to try to talk him around, but he's going to abandon the Giro then. The precedent for this being Roger de Vlamic in the 1976 Giro, <laughs> who on the Paso Mangan, um, he was riding with Johan de Moink in the Brooklyn team. The Pink and Panther. According to one of their teammates, Ercole Guazzalini, who spoke to Herbie Sykes years later, um, well, this is what Guazzalini said. Roger threw his bike into the woods like a maniac, then ran off straight into the forest. I thought, now what am I supposed to do? But I decided I should run after him to try to get him to come back. He was a good runner, Roger, and I couldn't catch him. <laughs> I was there scrabbling around in the trees, calling after him like an idiot, but he just vanished. Um, is this true? Napalm, remember him? Yeah. Um, he tried to establish whether this was true when he for lunch with Roger de Vlamic. was it last year or the year yeah, before? Yeah, last year. And, and the answer was so incomprehensible, indecipherable, that we're none the wiser. Uh, but because it would be a bit of a turn up for the book to know that would to happen yesterday, um, tomorrow. De Moink is Belgium's last Grand Tour winner, isn't he? Yeah. He won the Giro of what year? In 1977 or 8. I think it was 1978, Daniel, but I can't actually check that at the moment. But pretty sure... The reason for doing it was it was an anniversary. So Lionel went off in search of the Pink Panther, as he was known, and Roger Van. Very entertaining episode that for Friends of the Cycling Podcast, which you can uh, you can still sign up to last uh, well, year's uh, Friends of the Podcast episodes at thecyclingpodcast.com. Well, what about prediction, Rich? What do you think is going to happen? Um, I don't know, but I'll, I'll keep my voice down because we're in the Astana uh, Hotel just outside. Still no it. sign of Superman? No. Um, Let us down again? But, that's uh, the... That's the 19th consecutive episode he he, he's promised to said appear he'd be here. he said he would be here anyway um, have they been a bit disappointing this Giro 
as a team. We, the, we talked about them a lot coming into the race, about how strong they were going to be, how packed they were with really strong kind of cli- climbing. They won a stage. They won a stage, um, but did we not expect a bit more? Did we not expect them to rip it up? Or is it just because their leader, uh, Lopez, has not been perhaps in the form that he's he was in last year? I think it's that, isn't it, Rich? But uh, as I said I think yesterday, um, he's moved to a phase where he's going to start and um, there's a lot of talent coming out of South America in particular and you know we we observe every day this uh, the, the attention and the scrutiny uh, that focused on the South American riders and the, the South American media and South American public seems uh, maybe fickle is a bit unkind um, but you can very easily go from being the next phenomenon to the next kind of also run. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what, what happens next for Superman. Um, I, I don't think he's, uh, you know, he's ridden any differently really in this Giro from the way he's ridden in Grand Tours in the last couple of years. He's been strong on the climbs. He was very unlucky earlier in the Giro. He's also been strong towards the end and we did see him clip off today, get back a little bit of time. So he could certainly be a factor tomorrow what about Carapaz I mean we don't know an awful lot about him really do we he's got two children and um, he's 20 turned 26 during this Giro when he came over to uh, Europe initially I believe he already had a, a child and um, so he uh, he comes across as being very mature and very very collected and calm and um, not phased at all by the position he finds himself in which is surprising um, in the sense that He's never been in the situation and remotely resembling this, you know, even leading a kind of week-long race, really, has he? This is unknown uh, territory it, it, for it him. It is. I mean, if you look back at his previous Grand Tour results, I think he's done three Grand Tours to date. Um, he's always been very good in the last week, and in fact, in the last mountain stage, um, he has consistently been been strong. So I think Nibali has has very little hope tomorrow um, unless he can do something which is um, out of the ordinary, really. Um, I mean, I said that if I was in his position, I would probably wait until the last climb. Um, it, it, that will work if, if Carapaz is on a bad day. Um, it will not if Carapaz is riding the way he has been riding in the last week or so. So what option um, does that leave for Nibali? Maybe I'm... Uh, contradicting myself um, but he really I suppose might think that he needs to force Carapaz into some kind of mistake or some kind of panic um, Any tricky descents tomorrow? Well the, you know the Mangan is a fairly narrow road um, and it's a fairly steep descent, it's tree lined all the way down um, which, you know there there are places where um, Nibali might look to uh, gain something on a descent but there are, there are fairly substantial valleys as well that he's going to have to negotiate and I think Caruso will probably play a key role tomorrow and um, you know it's I think that the the abilities of the riders and and what they can produce over a sort of what's going to be a five six hour climb like tomorrow are very similar and um, you know whichever way you sort of slice and dice it they will pretty much end up where they should end up according to their abilities at the moment so you know, based on what we've seen so far, I think Carapaz is, is at least as good as Nibali, if not better. And he's also, you know, Nibali has got the experience, obviously, but Carapaz is surrounded by quite a lot of experience. Guys like Amador are going to be key tomorrow. Um, even Lander, um, who is this curial figure, he's been in this position before. And let's not forget, he's helped to bring a Grand Tour home for a couple of guys. Like we've we've tended to focus on the fact that he hasn't won them and he might be disappointed, but he was he was great for Chris Froome um, in the Tour de France in 2017. 17. And he was great for Fabio Aru in 2015 as well, although Aru didn't, didn't win that uh, Giro. So uh, my money's on... Well, my money's not on camera. I wouldn't. I wouldn't do such a thing as as bet, Richard. Um, metaphorically speaking. Yes, me- metaphorically speaking. Yeah, same here. I, I just. I mean, I'm confident Nibali's going to give it a really good go, and he's not. He's going to go down fighting, isn't he? Um, he's not going to. He's not going to follow Carapaz uh, and just, you know, finish. Finish. Be happy to finish on the podium. So we should, if nothing else, have an exciting stage. I think because I think today was a bit flat. It's been a, a quite a flat week, I think. Yeah. Um, after the sort of fireworks of the of last weekend, the long weekend, um, which threatened to really bring this this race to life, um, it, it has sort of 
um, whimpered towards its conclusion a little bit. Well, we'll wrap things up for tonight. Just before we go, you mentioned Club Zero, um, supported by Hans Grohe. Uh, showers and taps we have released nine kilometer zeros episodes of kilometer zero during the giro uh, and we're very grateful to hans Grohe for their support uh, they will also be supporting kilometer zero at the tour de france and at the vuelta which we're we're very pleased about indeed and uh, we hope you've enjoyed those episodes the last one today was called no cigars and it focused on the teams that haven't won stages but every day there's one fewer team that hasn't won a stage because Mitchell and Scott hadn't won a stage until today and now they're off us. Who will it be tomorrow? Well, tune in to the Cycling Podcast to find out. In the meantime, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Rich. And just before we go, a big thanks to the following friends of the podcast, James Jordan, Dean Minchelo, Peter Matthias, Mary Bauer, or Boer, Tony Moffa, Masinga Sanguete, Graham Flett, JJ Stainer, Chris Bracewell, Laura Vignol, I'm going to say that's French, um, but I'm not sure, Jeff Rayner and um, Pavel Tonkov, second straight day. <laughs> really, that's a, once is enough, Pav. Pavel, Pavel's very generous. Apologies if there have been a few problems with the sound quality tonight. We did have a faulty cable, which we only discovered at the end. So sorry about that, and we'll get it resolved for tomorrow night's podcast. Nuspic de chicola Se lo mangiano le femmine